What? He just, he just flew his plane right into it. Nothing funny about that. October 28th, 1944. What happens this week? This week comes the largest naval battle in history. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Germans engineered a coup in Hungary that kept Hungary in the war on their side. The Soviets liberated Belgrade, and the Western Allies took Aachen, the first large German city, to fall. And on the other side of the world, Vinegar Joe Stilwell was recalled from China, there were American air raids on the Philippines, and then the Americans made landings on Leyte. As I mentioned, when the Japanese learned the 17th those landings were to happen, they put a plan in motion to destroy the landing ships and transports. But you know, Moving a navy around takes time, and their battleships and cruisers were near Sumatra, and the carriers were at home on the inland sea. This all means they don't arrive to the Philippines until the 24th, four days after the landings. And the Americans by then have already sent away much of their shipping and established headquarters ashore. But what they have in the Gulf of Leyte, or near it at any rate, are a few dozen cargo ships, a similar number of LSTs, six old battleships, a variety of cruisers and destroyers. That's elements of 7th Fleet, the covering force, and there are a bunch of escort carriers attached. Takeo Kurita is commander of the center force of the Japanese fleet. And on the 23rd, they're passing Palawan Island after refueling at Brunei. A pretty powerful force, Kurita has Yamato and Musashi, the two super battleships, plus three older battleships and ten heavy cruisers. Kurita has a cruiser as his flagship and is leading the way. Two American subs, though, have managed to sight his force, and they sink two cruisers and damage a third one. Kurita actually has to swim to safety after losing his flagship. This also alerts Third Fleet Commander Bull Halsey that the Japanese are really coming in force. Which, for a change, the Americans did not already know, since recently the Japanese have changed naval codes, and they've also been maintaining radio silence. The 24th, center force hits the Philippines below Luzon, aiming for the San Bernardino Strait, and then south to Leyte Gulf. Meanwhile, a second force under Jisaburo Ozawa has arrived from Japan. This is four carriers, which are very nearly empty of planes, two old battleships and three light cruisers. They're sitting around northeast of Luzon as bait to lure Halsey's carrier Armada away from the center force. A third force under Shoji Nishimura is coming from the Mindanao Sea and planning on reaching Leyte Gulf through the Surigao Strait, two battleships and one heavy cruiser. Behind him is a fourth force of one light and two heavy cruisers under Kiyohide Shima and escorting the Japanese forces is 31 destroyers. If the three non-decoy forces can link up and the American carriers take the bait and they move off, the Japanese could just devastate the American shipping in the Gulf covering the landings. Halsey is aboard battleship New Jersey, his flagship northeast of Luzon. But guess what? You know all those raids we've seen the past few weeks against places like Formosa? Well, after all that, he sent two of his four carrier task groups to Ulithi, with two of his attack carriers also along. When he learns of center force, he recalls them, and one of them arrives before the 24. See, he has thought the Japanese wouldn't interfere with the Leyte landings, but would wait for ones on Luzon. He is wrong. The morning of the 24th, American scout planes find center force in the Sibuyan Sea, and Halsey sends out two of his carrier groups to attack. The third is itself under attack by Japanese land-based planes from Luzon. The two groups attacking center force manage to gather 251 planes. They make four waves of attacks, focusing primarily on the gigantic super battleships, with Yamato now Kurita's flagship. Somewhere in the neighborhood, of 20 torpedoes and 17 bombs in total hit Musashi, and explosions in its engine room flood the boilers and cause it to lose power. It falls out of formation and eventually sinks. Yamato is hit by bombs that penetrate the hull, but it survives. Cruiser Miyoko is hit pretty bad and returns to Brunei. Kurita withdraws, but later in the day resumes course for a nighttime race through San Bernardino Strait. Scout planes 
Also find Nishimura's group heading for the Mindanao Sea the morning of the 24th, and then airstrikes damage both of his pre-World War I dreadnought area battleships. Karita has been begging Japanese command for aerial support the whole day, but instead they launched their land-based planes against that third carrier group that I mentioned. That's three attacks of like 60 planes each time. Defending planes just demolish them, but one plane manages to drop a bomb right through the light carrier Princeton's flight deck, setting off explosions and fires. Eventually, this sets off the weapons store and blows up Princeton's stern, sending chunks of debris onto the deck of light cruiser Birmingham. Princeton is later scuttled by torpedoes and Birmingham sent home for repairs. At 4.40 p.m. the 24th, American scout planes finally find the decoy force of carriers and battleships as intended. Halsey orders his groups to gather and head north along the Luzon coast by night to attack them in the morning. Meanwhile, around midnight, center force clears the strait and heads south along the coast of Samar. Halsey thinks they've been diminished to the point that Tom Kincaid's 7th Fleet can handle them. Halsey was not there for the fleet-on-fleet -fleet battles like Midway and the Coral Sea, so this is actually his first fleet-on-fleet -fleet engagement. However, despite his inexperience, Halsey was a critical player in the transformation of naval warfare occurring at this moment. He had been the one to attack the Japanese air forces on the Okinawa, Formosa, Philippines island chain, hammering at them so long and hard that even Japanese carrier trainees were transferred to the islands, leaving nearly empty carriers for Ozawa to bring to the Philippines as sacrificial lambs. The Japanese Navy could no longer muster the fuel, ammunition, and trained pilots to conduct battle. All it could attempt to do was inflict maximum damage on the American forces. The following day, the 25th, thus begins the era of kamikaze warfare, but the fleet battle begins at 10.50 p.m. the night of the 24th. Nishimura enters the Surigao Strait. 39 torpedo boats harass him over the next few hours, but fail to do any damage. And the main action of the Battle of Surigao Strait starts at 3 a.m. in the narrowest part of the strait, the American ships deployed in lines awaiting their enemy. The destroyer lines launch 47 torpedoes in waves. Battleship Fuso is hit and hit bad and sinks within the hour. Three of Nishimura's four destroyers are hit and all three are sunk before morning, but the smoke the radar clutter and enemy counterfire prevent any more sinking, and Nishimura plows ahead towards Leyte Gulf, knowing that Shima's force is catching up. But Nishimura is actually in deep trouble. At 3.51 a.m., four heavy and four light cruisers of the 7th Fleet open fire. The six battleships behind them open fire shortly after. They are heading in lines west to east and back, crossing the T so that all guns can be brought to bear against an enemy that can only use forward guns. It's actually a pretty poorly executed maneuver this time, but it still has effect. Battleship Yamashiro is on fire, then a torpedo hits its engine room. Nishimura sends out the message, we proceed to Leyte for total annihilation. And then his flagship takes another torpedo, capsizes and sinks. Of the crew of 1,600, 10 survive. The Japanese cruiser and destroyer left head back into the Mindanao Sea. The former will sink within hours. Shima figures he'll get what Nishimura got if he stays course, so he turns around and heads south. Karita's force leaves the San Bernardino Strait, and then around dawn, about 130 kilometers from the entrance to Leyte Gulf, his scouts spot American carriers. They also spot his force. Both sides are surprised. The American force is an escort carrier group of six attached to 7th Fleet, backed by three destroyers, Taffy 3. The carriers have a decent-sized air force altogether, but if they don't get them into the air, they are doomed against superior Japanese speed and firepower. Taffy 3 commander Ziggy Sprague starts launching planes as fast as he can, though they don't have any armor-piercing bombs to take out battleships. He turns the carriers south, orders all ships to make smoke, which lays low on the water, and orders the destroyers to attack with torpedoes. 
So they raced towards the six enemy heavy cruisers and four battleships beyond them. They lay spreads of torpedoes, which not only forced evasive actions that wrecked the Japanese formation, but a hit and a near-miss explosion forced two cruisers to withdraw. Karita is now down from 10 cruisers on the 23rd to four now. Admiral Karita was slow to bring his full power to bear on the enemy. In this, his first encounter with escort carriers, his lookouts took them for the fast carriers of Halsey's fleet. Furthermore, the American destroyers, though half the size, had a silhouette quite similar to that of the current American heavy cruisers. Holding this image of fast carriers and heavy cruisers, Carita may have failed to realize that the enemy was much slower, thereby providing him with an opportunity to close fast and sink the carriers before an organized air attack arrived. Still, by 9 a.m., the Japanese are closing in. The American destroyers go out again, but they've had it. Three soon go down. However, Felix Stump's Taffy 2 is by now nearby, and he's also launched a lot of planes. The American air power makes itself felt, damaging two more cruisers. Carita is down to two. And then, at 9-11, to the great surprise of the Americans, Carita's ships bearing down on Taffy 3, ships that will surely destroy it, turn around and head off. Why? Uh, well, in the past 48 hours, he's swum for his life from a sinking ship. He's faced hours of aerial attacks, all while recovering from dengue fever. His force is currently under heavy aerial attack, and he may well have the mental picture that the ships he sunk are major capital ships. A variety of sources say he does think he's fighting full third fleet carriers. He also could have gotten word about Nishimura's loss and Shima's withdrawal. Though Japanese communications here are terrible, so maybe not. I'll quote Implacable Foes one more time. Building in Karita's mind were three convictions. First, evidently the Americans were using the Takloban and Dulag airfields on Leyte, and thus were already established on the island and capable of defending their beachhead. Second, to enter the Gulf would threaten his force with entrapment. He had no knowledge of what size force the Americans had in the Gulf and in the Gulf, he would lack room to maneuver. Third, he concluded that given his assumptions on American strength, he would not be able to inflict on the enemy losses great enough to justify his own. But you know, he isn't a lone wolf, right? It's sacrifices by other elements of the fleet, like the carriers, that are to allow him to enter Leyte Gulf and destroy American transports and shipping there. But he does not take that responsibility and we'll head back for San Bernardino Strait. There's a little more to it than that, but Carita will later say, I did not know that Admiral Halsey had taken his fleet to the north. I moved only with the knowledge that I was able to acquire with my own eyes and did not realize how close I was to victory. As for Halsey's armada and its mission to destroy Ozawa's carriers, ahead of his five full and five light carriers, he has a group of six fast battleships two heavy and six light cruisers, and 18 destroyers. Five more carriers are also en route to join them. At dawn the 25th, scout planes spot the enemy. Two airstrikes sink a light carrier and set another one on fire. Suddenly, at 11.15 though, Halsey orders the battleship force to turn around and head back, leaving the carrier groups and cruisers and destroyers. Why? Well, 7th Fleet has been sending increasingly desperate sounding messages to Halsey. They want to make sure that San Bernardino Strait is covered and think that this is Halsey's fleet's job. Well, Willis Lee's fast battleship force under Halsey's job, anyhow. The messages begin with request, and then they move on to urgent, and then where is Lee, send Lee, and then Pacific Ocean Area Commander Chester Nimitz himself sends to Halsey, where is Task Force 34? Tappy 34 is the battleship force. Halsey curses and swears, but orders the ships turned around. But Carita beats the battleships to the strait by three hours. Mark Misher's carrier planes, meanwhile, wreak great havoc on Ozawa's ships, sinking all four carriers by the end of the 25th. The Japanese battleships are damaged, 
but they and the cruiser escaped to Japan. Still, for the overall Battle of Leyte Gulf, all these battles together, Surigao Strait, Samar, Cape, and Ganyo, the Japanese lose four carriers, three battleships, 10 cruisers, and 11 destroyers for over 300,000 tons. In terms of total displacement of ships used or displacement of ships sunk, it's the largest naval battle in history, though not in simple number of ships involved. The battle has absolutely crippled the Japanese Navy and opened the China Sea to American maneuvers. There have been plenty of mistakes made on the American side, yes, and communications issues and hassles, but the American Navy simply proved more capable. However, I did mention the kamikaze era beginning, and indeed it does. For the 25th and the 26th, kamikaze planes hit ships of Taffy 1 and Taffy 3. In Taffy 3, the escort carrier St. Lou is sunk, and two more are so badly damaged they have to return to the States and will not return. In Taffy 1, four escort carriers are damaged and three of them have to head to the States for repairs. So that is seven carriers either lost or out of action for a long time for the cost of seven Japanese planes and seven Japanese lives lost. The Japanese Navy might be unable to fight battles anymore, but it can still sure do a lot of damage. As for the actual landings on Leyte, on the 22nd, the invaders push forward with 7th Division advancing the most towards Abuyo. The 24th, elements of 1st Cavalry Division cross the San Juanico Strait from Tacloban to Samar. Today, the 27th, the 7th Division takes Bury Airfield. But here's the thing. The Japanese are heavily reinforcing Leyte, and what's left of the Japanese Air Force has been flying into the Philippines from all of the Japanese inner islands, and Japanese commander Shiro Makino, who has been withdrawing into the mountains, is expecting to very much use air power for his counterattack. It's the Germans that are withdrawing from the Soviets in Finland. In fact, on the 27th, the Soviets reached the Finnish-Norwegian border, and by the 23rd, they've cleared the whole Petsamo area. The 25th, they enter Norway and take Kerkenes. In Slovakia, it's the Slovaks who are withdrawing, or more precisely being overrun by the Germans. This week, actually, the German armor and SS troops really do a number on the Slovaks, taking Brezno the 25th, Zvolen the 27th, and that same day overrunning Banska Bystrica, which has been the seat of the Slovak National Uprising. The National Council manages to evacuate and heads to Donovali in the north. Also, the Czechoslovak fighter regiment has to fly back behind Soviet lines when panzers appear at Sri Duma airfield, its only base. After that, German planes can come in and direct their deadly fire on the roads from Banska Bystrica, which are choked with both soldiers and civilians leaving the city. Things do not look good for the Slovak uprising. They do look generally good for the Soviets, though, from Slovakia on down south. Ivan Petrov's 4th Ukrainian Front's mobile group finally makes gains this week, battling forwards and taking Mukachevo the 26th and Uzhorod the 27th. Already on the 26th, though, the pincers from his front and those from 2nd Ukrainian Front link up near Uzhorod, so with Petrov's operation coming to an end, he and 2nd Ukrainian Front Commander Rodion Malinovsky now have a united front. In Hungary, after taking Debrecen, Malinovsky's right wing heads north and takes Nerechaza the 22nd. When they reach the Tiza at Dombrad, all the enemy divisions east of Debrecen and south of the Tiza are suddenly cut off, though they retake Nerechaza the 25th and reopen an escape route. But the end of the Debrecen operation leaves Malinovsky in good position and Transylvania has been cleared of the enemy. Although for the first time in two months, German Army Group South has a continuous front from Nerechaza all the way down to Yugoslavia to what's left of Army Group F. It is Fyodor Tolbukin's third Ukrainian front who mainly fought along the Belgrade axis. The battle in Belgrade and the surrounding area cost the Germans 15,000 dead and 9,000 men taken prisoner. And much of Army Group F has been 
ground into pieces or also taken prisoner, with particular exception of those forces at Kraljevo holding the road to Sarajevo open for Army Group E to evacuate from Greece. The Soviets and the Yugoslav partisans have also taken heavy casualties, of course. On the 22nd is a huge procession through the streets of Belgrade, where the bodies of their dead are drawn along to communal graves. Later on, Marshal Tito holds a victory parade for Yugoslav units in a suburb of the city. You may think the Soviets would have attacked into the rest of Yugoslavia after taking Belgrade and Nish, like towards Kraljevo, but they do not do that in force. Remember, the deal Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin recently made about spheres of influence includes a shared Yugoslavia. Instead, the Soviets move units up the Danube towards Novi Sad, liberating it the 23rd. This is to cover Malinovsky's flank, and they link up with him. So now they too have a united front, and the future plan is to attack towards Budapest and Hungary. The Allies are still hitting the Germans from the west as well, of course. Second Canadian Corps is slowly pushing Knut Eberding's forces into a new pocket near Siebrugge. Spoiler, next week they'll capture Eberding. Now, British First Corps, also from First Canadian Army, is a pretty international gang. They are at the Dutch-Belgian border and have one British division, one Polish armored division, and one Canadian armored division. On the 23rd, they add to that the 104th US Infantry Division, a unit that has yet to experience combat. They're deployed southwest of Zundert, which is their initial objective. They have their baptism of fire the 25th. By the morning of the 27th, they have advanced into position to assault Zundert, and they take it today and also advance halfway to Breda. But on the 26th, German commander in the West, Gerd von Rundstedt, authorizes a withdrawal in the face of British First Corps but announces to Hitler that this is in no way the beginning of a general withdrawal. Then, today the 28th, he announces that 15th Army will fight to the last before the Meuse, the Moss, and not withdraw across it, but they can expect its total destruction doing so. There is, though, one problem with the general Allied offensive and the fight for Aachen, which fell last week. And until the problem is addressed, the Allies cannot launch any Ruhr offensive. The region between the Nijmegen salient and the positions held by 19th Corps north of Maastricht, the Peel Marshes. There were some unsuccessful Allied attempts to break into them in late September and early October. But on October 16th, when Army Group Commander Bernard Montgomery called off all Second Army operations that were not designed to help open Antwerp's port, any ideas of action here were suspended. That quiet lasted for 10 days. See, the Germans have not filed it away under for later. In fact, they're trying to find a way to help relieve 15th Army. And Walter Modo thinks hitting the salient from the Peel Marshes might do the trick. Rundstedt endorses his attack plan, and the morning of the 27th, 47th Panzer Corps and 9th Panzer Division attack. They hit the pretty sparsely manned American 7th Armored Division lines west of Venlo along two canals in the marshes. In fighting both yesterday and today, they do take ground and fight off any and all counterattacks by 7th Armored. As for the 5th Army advance on Bologna in Italy, attacks are made several times towards Vedriano this week, but they fail, the weather turns, and the offensive is called off 16 kilometers short of Bologna. Just this month, though, 5th Army has taken over 13,000 casualties, and there is a lack of replacements. So you can see, they really don't have the strength to reach the city. And the week comes to its end. Having seen the largest naval battle ever, which has wrecked the Japanese Navy, landings on Leyte exploited, consolidation of the Soviet lines, action in Belgium and the Netherlands, oh, and also their British 12th Corps, launches an attack with four divisions, the 22nd, to reach and clear the south bank of the Meuse. They take Tilburg today, the 28th. Also today, the 28th, a USSR-Bulgaria armistice is finally signed. Bulgarian troops are now officially under Soviet command. October 28th, today. Today, I'm going to end with a big long quote 
from John Erickson from The Road to Berlin about today, October 28th, 1944. He has a way with words, as you know. And this is something I haven't yet mentioned this episode. On the 28th of October, 1944, having already surveyed the outcome of the gigantic offensive operations conducted by the Red Army during the summer and early autumn, senior officers from the Soviet General Staff in Moscow bent over their maps and poured over their calculations to complete the operational plan for the final campaign of the war, the Soviet invasion of Hitler's Reich. This was the preparation of nothing less than the greatest campaign in military history, a campaign that was to unleash men in their millions and machines in their thousands, fusing mass battlefield efficiency with an elemental appetite for revenge, combining at the end cruel, unrelenting fighting with a rampage of almost animalistic fury. Behind the Soviet army lay mile after mile of stupefying ruination and the terrible, staggering weight of their own dead. Ahead, at long last, the lair of the fascist beasts, the approaches to which were emblazoned with savage propaganda signs and slogans designed to ravage the soldier's memory with the evocation of past crimes committed by a now shuddering enemy on him and his own. Whenever that campaign to try to reach Berlin gets going, we will be right here to cover it. We can do that thanks to the sterling efforts of the Time Ghost Army. You too can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest commissioned officers in the army, and the army member of the week is Matija Grabnar. And hey, if you want to see when the German offensive against the Soviets began, you can click right here for the extra weekly episode that came out in June 1941, It sets it all up. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.